Um, relevant, maybe, sometimes. I mean, okay. Let, let me say this about what the devil does in this world. Even though the devil has the same access to the written word that we do, he doesn't believe it. Okay, he thinks that he can come up with an alternative scenario to this. And so, because of that, he is really at a disadvantage. Because this is the way that it's going to turn out. And we know that, and by believing that, as long as we will believe that, we will be victorious. But the devil doesn't know what we're going to do. Now, God knows what we're going to do. He knows the end from the beginning. But the devil doesn't. And so, the devil kind of hangs back on a lot of stuff to, to watch us, to see how we're going to react to various situations. And he does that for all of humanity throughout the whole world. And so, um, for Christians to, uh, to disregard the whole subject of, of what the devil's operation is in planet Earth um, is not good. And I believe you all understand that. And so, you know, we're not giving the devil glory by, by studying him and his methods and his intention where he is leading things. We're, we're not worshiping Satan. God is, has revealed this to us out of his word. But there's three reasons three really good reasons why we need to know what the devil is up to and we need to know his methods and so forth. And the first one is like Jesus said that in the last days the devil would try to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. Now, a lot of Christians read that and say, oh, well, but that's not possible. Well, let me say something about that word, if possible, in the scripture. You know, Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 11, I think it was, that by his union with Jesus, that if possible, he would attain to the resurrection from the dead, even while in the body. I mean, is that possible for a human to, to not die physically? Yes, it's possible. So, therefore, is it possible for the very elect to be deceived? Yes, it is possible. So, we, we are doing this... God is showing us these things so we will not be deceived. But there's an even bigger reason why we are studying what the devil is up to. Turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 2. And when I saw this yesterday as I was preparing these notes, I had one of those aha moments. A light bulb went off in me and it's like oh oh I get it it was like duh the reason why God wants us to understand Satan and his methodology another reason besides that other one is right here Hebrews chapter 2 verse story verse 5 for it was not to angels that God subjected the habitable future, the habitable world of the future of which we speak. Well, if it's not to angels, then who is it to? Well, it goes on to say, it has been solemnly and earnestly said in a certain place, which is Psalm 8, by the way, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you graciously and helpfully care for and visit and look after him. For some time, for some little time, you have ranked him lower than or and inferior to the angels. Well, that's us now. But you have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. Well, that's actually, God has already started that with Adam and Eve. Okay? The original world was under the tutelage of angels. Lucifer and, 
and all of the, the angels, the good ones and, and what are now the bad ones, what was, was, was in charge of God's creation before he created Adam and Eve. And Lucifer messed up. And so he was fired from his job. He was not thrown in the lake of fire or thrown in the penitentiary, but he was fired. You're fired! And so God created us, but, but strangely enough, He created us in an inferior position to the ones whose job we're filling. Hey, you know what? I know what that's like. The shoes that I am filling are big shoes to fill. Let me tell you. Okay? And most of the time, just with ever a couple of little exceptions, but generally speaking, I feel very as a very inferior Christian to almost everybody that I have the opportunity to speak to. It's like, well, y'all are doing a better job of, of walking with Jesus than I am. Why am I up here? Why am I not out there and one of y'all up here? Because God put me here. Well, that's probably what Adam was saying. Well, Adam was, was, you know, set over all of God's creation. And there was, you know, all of this other stuff that he wasn't really quite up there, you know, uh, attuned to. And therefore he and Eve fell. But God didn't see fit to, to fire him. You know, he, is, he didn't say, okay, well, I'm going to put Lucifer back in that job and you're fired. But no, no, Adam and Eve were still over, set over the works of God's hands. We are still, humanity is still set over the works of God's hands. And even, even the bad guys, the ones that are, that are raping and pillaging this planet and, and taking its oil and taking its resources, they are still among the race of beings that God set over this planet. So, what the devil has to do then is to deceive humanity so that we will do his bidding instead of God's bidding. That's what's going on on planet Earth, always since the Garden of Eden, and it's going to come to a zenith. And a third reason is really kind of what Steve was driving at with Friday night about us knowing that we know that we know what's going to happen in the end times, and that is you will be confronted at some time with people who don't have it straight about what's going to happen in the end times. And, you know, there's all different versions of that, and I'm not going to attempt to try to refute every one. I, I think maybe, Steve, you have some more questions that you intend to ask before that process is done, probably. So, there's a lot of error out there, and God wants us to know the truth so we can inform other people. That would be a third reason why we are studying Antichrist. Now, today, finally, after six other messages, I'm going to talk about the Antichrist, about that one who is called the Antichrist. So, so far we've been talking about the spirit of Antichrist and how that has been at work in the world. But we're going to talk about the Antichrist. But I will say about that, there's a lot of confusion about that subject right there. I would say second maybe only to the question about, well, when is the rapture going to happen? The second most common question about end time prophecy is, well, who is the Antichrist? Well, today we're not going to talk about who the Antichrist is. We're going to talk about what the Antichrist is. Now, there is a, a subtle difference. But the problem about him being a who is, first of all, most people... You know, I'm, I'm not even sure I could, I could venture a guess. But even in the world, there's probably two or three scriptures that even just your, your rank heathen know. And one of them is the, the last verse in Revelation chapter 13 that says, 
the number of his name is 666. And, you know, even people out in the world will, will take that and try to will figure out what is that? Is it the universal product code? Or is it somebody whose names, you know, their first name, their middle name, and their last name has six characters, like Ronald Reagan or something like that, right? Okay. Well, look, let me tell you something. That is, that is not what 666 is about. It probably has something more to do with, with quantum physics or something like that, that once the truth is known, we're like, oh, well, yeah, that's been, that's been part of this here. And so, yeah, the devil's using that to bring forth the Antichrist. But, see, people will, another thing people will do about that, who is the Antichrist? They'll pick some political leader or some celebrity that they don't like. And they'll say, well, he's got to be the Antichrist. Well, there's a problem with that, and we will get into that today. And that is... The Antichrist is not going to be someone that, by and large, hardly anybody on the planet is going to dislike, at least not initially. I mean, that's how he gets to be where he is, is because it's, it's attractive to humanity. It, it appeals to the flesh, everybody's flesh, Democrat or Republican, black or white, communist or capitalist. It, it's going to be something, everybody said, well, finally, we've got a leader that, that's, that can fix everything. And that's not going to be Barack Obama, okay? <laughs> Just saying, okay. But another reason why I want you to not be even trying to wreck your brain about who the Antichrist might be is because if you knew, that would mean that the first, rap, first fruits rapture has already happened and you missed it. Yes. <laughs> because, go, go, to, um, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is what it says. And we talked about this last week, by the way. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse... 7 says the mystery of lawlessness which is what the devil is using to bring forth the Antichrist. We've talked about that. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work in the world but it is restrained. It is kateko. It is held down. It is prevented from coming to fruition until, only until, he who restrains is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed. So if the Antichrist has already been revealed to you, that, that tells you that you were not a restrainer and that there ain't any restrainers left on planet Earth at the moment. <laughs> Uh, what a horrible state to be in. And the world's going to be in that state here real soon. Okay. Now, there's something else I'll just say about that in passing. And that is, there seem to be among Christians, among born-again people, among God's people, there seem to be two prevalent uh, attitudes toward this mystery of lawlessness thing that's bringing fourth the Antichrist and I'm suggesting neither one of those two is the right way and that there is a, a third way that is the right way which is the one that that we have been taught about over and over and over which is uh, you know the man child and the woman fleeing to the wilderness and so forth okay but the two the two prevalent views about this are okay one is what is generally put forth by, and yes, Ellen, I'm going to draw something up here. Okay, uh, one is generally put forth by Christians who might call themselves dominionist, and that is uh, 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 let's see, how would I call this? Uh, 
take charge. Whether that means with, through political means or through armed conflict. You know, I mean, uh, uh, Baron Van Clausewitz, the, the Prussian military leader, said that uh, war or armed conflict is just politics by another means. So really, p politics and war are just kind of, they're joined at the hip, really. So the, the Dominionists say, well, the way to, to come against the Antichrist is, well, just don't let him come to power at all. Well, <laughs> then what do we do with all of this in the Bible that talks about him? Oh, well, that doesn't have to happen. Okay, well, well, those that think, well, they're going to take up arms and, and, you know, get round up all the bad guys and take them to Guantanamo or, or kill them all or whatever. That's, that's this view over here. Okay, the other view that is diametrically opposite to that, and this one's going to happen a lot, but that doesn't mean that we have to choose it. And that is martyrdom. Well, are those our only two choices? To politically defeat the forces of Antichrist in the world or be martyred? Is that, is that those are our only two choices? No. The other choice I'll just call Revelation 12. which is what we've been teaching throughout. It's what Owen Cain taught throughout, what Steve Jordan teaches throughout. What I teach is the church brings forth a mature Christian, but what does that mature Christian do? They are caught up to God. They come back and have instruction for the body, and basically what is that instruction? Flee Babylon. Well, that's not, that's not taking charge. <laughs> well, guess what? It's not our job to take charge until Jesus takes charge. And he's going to let the Antichrist have his day for three and a half years. Okay? So that's not our job. And God is not willing that any should perish. Well, how come so many do? Because they didn't do that. Now, I know that seem, this, really both of these, or both that and that can seem to the fleshly mind to be kind of cowardly. But I'll tell you, it's not. Because when you are in the wilderness, it says you are fed and kept safe. Kept safe by who? By what? By, by God's angels, by God's spirit. And furthermore, once that period of time has passed, presumably everyone that's in the wilderness has been brought to the same level of maturity that the, <clears throat> the, the first fruits are. And there's another catching up to the Lord to receive another set of instructions, which is to come back on white horses and to wipe out the corruptors of the earth. But see, we're not going to wipe out the corruptors of the earth with our own means. We sang it in, a mighty fortress is our God. If we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Just saying. Okay. So, without further ado, let's see what we can find out about what the Antichrist is. You're in 2 Thessalonians, right? Go to verse 3. <clears throat> let no one deceive or beguile you in any way. You know, there is... Uh, there, <laughs> pardon my French here. Mark Twain had a famous saying. There's lies, there's damn lies, and then there's statistics. <laughs> Well, if you get your truth from the media, you're getting one of those three things. And they're going to use a lot of statistics to try to, to 
to manipulate your thinking on things. Okay? And beguiling means that you are open and receptive to this lie that is going to be told to you. Now, there are those who, who really agree with the mainstream media narrative about, oh no, there was no election fraud in 2020, or oh yes, this, this COVID-19 is, is the worst thing that has happened since the, the Spanish flu in 1918, or you know, you name it, or, or yeah, yeah, America's a racist nation, or all of these things that the media is putting forth constantly. There's some people who are, who that makes them feel good. I'm not really sure why, but it does. Well, that's being beguiled. That's not just you're being lied to, but you're being told a lie that you like to hear. Okay? And so, this right here is addressed to us. This is saying you as Christians who maybe don't like all that stuff the, the mainstream media is, tell, is lying to you. Well, guess what? The devil can tell you lies as Christians that would sound good to you. Right? He's warning you, hey, that stuff the media is doing is not the only weapons in the devil's arsenal. He's got some things that are going to sound good to Christians. Uh, mainly this one here. <laughs> yeah, we're going we're gonna to take over the seven mountains of culture and we're going to take this planet back. We're going to have a great revival and everybody is going to get saved and then we're going to hand the planet back to Jesus. That's just one. I mean, there are several. But he says, let no one beguile you in any way, for that day will not come except the apostasy comes first. And the apostasy is a falling away of Christians. Not a great revival. An apostasy. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, who is the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself proudly and insolently, against and over all that is called God or that is worshipped, even to his actually taking his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming that he himself is God. Do you not recollect that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining him. Well, we talked about that last Sunday, but let me finish this and then we'll go back and unpack some of this. Now you know what is restraining him from being revealed at this time, July the 18th, 2021. Why, why do we not know who he is? Because, watch this, is so that he may be revealed in his own appointed time. That word is a very interesting word. An appointed time, it's number 2540 in Strong's Concordance. The word in Greek is keros. And that doesn't just mean like clock time. It means a specific, a set time that is marked according to um, Mount's dictionary of Greek words. It has to do with the suitableness of times. You know, it says like in Galatians that at the suitable time, God brought forth his son. That God, and, and you know, we've studied about the Moedim, about the, uh, the feast days, that those are rehearsals for a future suitable time. That, you know, Jesus was um, killed during Passover, right? That was a suitable time for that. If he'd have been killed on the ninth of Av, then, you know, some would have thought that was okay because that's when the temple was destroyed. But no, that wasn't, he wasn't just there to, to show a destruction of a temple. He was the, there to show that his sacrifice of his life was to pay for sins and that he was risen, rose from the dead to show that uh, he's God and that, that it's, it's more than just another person being killed in a military or political coup of some kind. Okay, so keep the place here. Go to Daniel chapter 8. So what could possibly be a suitable time for the Antichrist to be revealed? 
Well, I'll tell you, we're heading rapidly toward that time because it says in Daniel chapter 8, verse 23, at the latter end of their kingdom, and that's referring to world empires, when the transgressors have reached the fullness, a king of fierce countenance, understanding dark trickery and craftiness shall stand up. So, the suitable time for the Antichrist to be revealed is when the earth is in such a decadent state, the people of the earth are so um, deceived and, and so uh, following after their flesh and so uh, sinful that he can come forth and he'll look good. You know, he wouldn't, look, he wouldn't have looked good 50 years ago. He wouldn't have looked good uh, in 1776. He wouldn't have looked good in, in 1518 when Martin Luther brought the, you know, the, his, nailed his theses to the door of the cathedral in, in uh, wherever that place was. Um, but he's going to look good at an appointed time. And like I said, we are racing toward that time. Okay, go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's go back and pick up some more things in here that tell us things about the Antichrist. Here's one. And we could, we could almost gloss over this one, but I'm not going to. Because we're going to have to we're going to have to try to wrap our minds around this. It says in verse 3 that he is the man of lawlessness. Well, that word man there, number 444 in Strong's Concordance, actually means to have the face of a human being, to have the appearance of a human that doesn't mean that he is necessarily fully human like you and me. Because in Daniel, um, it spoke of, of uh, Gabriel as a man. That man, Gabriel, and he's an angel. And of course, in Hebrews, it says that be good to strangers because some have entertained angels thinking that they're other humans. Well, what does that tell you? That just because somebody looks human doesn't mean that they're necessarily like you and me. All right, you're talking science fiction stuff. Well, listen. It says in, in Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, that nothing a man imagines is impossible. If it can enter into somebody's mind to put it in a novel or a movie, then it can, then it can happen. That doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it can happen. So if science fiction has shape-shifting people that one minute they look like a person and the next minute they look like a lizard, that's possible. Well, how, how does that work? Well, I don't really want to know. <laughs> okay, but I need to, we need to at least be aware that everything that appears human doesn't mean that they're like you and me. Okay, so for it to refer to the Antichrist as a man doesn't mean that, oh, well, he's just a political leader. You know, he's just, just uh, Prince Ben Salman in Saudi Arabia. Well, maybe so, but I really kind of doubt that one. Or some will say, well, he's Erdogan in, uh, in Turkey. Well, I kind of doubt that one too. You know, they were saying, well, it was Benjamin Netanyahu, right? <laughs> yeah, a lot of them were saying, well, it was Bill Clinton. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, I think the devil is smarter than that. I, when I say smarter, I don't mean wiser. I mean sneakier than that. Okay, and it says he's a man of lawlessness. That's, that's part of what is going to be the appointed time. Keep the place here. Go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. 
Lawlessness, number 458 in Strong's Concordance, doesn't just mean um, to violate the law. It involves iniquity. Iniquity would cover things like family curses. And it would also cover things like cultural uh, sins, so national sins. You know, there are spirit forces over territories, right? You know, there's the prince of Persia, there's the prince of Greece. Well, there's a prince over DFW, and it's not the same prince that's over Austin, or it's not the same prince that's over New York City, or the same prince that's over Los Angeles, or San Francisco, or Seattle. So, well then, then what, uh, what denotes the difference? Well, you just look at the, at the mood and at the, the culture and at the way life is conducted in those places, okay? And that will reveal the iniquities of the people that are in that. You know, there's probably a certain vulnerability that people in Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex have towards certain types of sins that may be different than the, the people that live in Austin or the people that live in San Francisco or whatnot. Okay, so that's iniquity. And in Matthew 24, verse 12, it says that the love of the great body of people will grow cold because of the multiplied lawlessness and iniquity. This is something else that shows how we are headed toward the revealing of the Antichrist because we're seeing this rising tide of hostility even in the body of Christ. We're, we're seeing, I mean, you know, Steve was talking about on, the, uh, on Facebook or on the Internet, even among those who are Christians who are studying Bible prophecy, you, you will get insulted you, you will get called all kinds of names and, and you will be argued with in a hostile manner if you disagree with this other person's theology. Well, that's not love. Now, love, of course, is what it talks about in 1 Corinthians 13. And granted, that has, you know, Jesus said, by this shall you know that you're my disciple if you have love for one another. That is not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. You know, even said, love your enemies. Well, that's not easy. Okay, but on the other hand, to the degree that we don't practice love, that's what the spirit of Antichrist is using to forward his agenda in this world. Okay, back to, keep the place in Matthew. Go back to 2 Thessalonians. It says at the end of verse 3 that the Antichrist is the son of perdition. Well, here again, the word son of, or the phrase son of, does not always refer to natural ancestry. It, it generally does, I will say, you know. You know I, Isaac was the son of Abraham, and so on and so forth. But that phrase in Hebrew and in Greek can refer to something which is just simply connected to someone or something else. Um, you know, there's in the Old Testament a lot of times you see the sons of Belial. Well, that just simply meant those who were following a path of wickedness. You know, we would think of uh, drug gangs, MS-13 or whatnot, as their sons of Belial. Okay, that means they're connected to something that's evil. And it could also have to do with um, being artificially, and when I say artificially, I mean not through physical means, but through some other kind of means. Okay, you know, you didn't become a son of God by 
artificial and about by by some kind of physical sexual process it's a spiritual thing right you're sons of God because you received the word that that's how you became a son well the word it says in the New Testament is seed and whether that's you know wheat or whether that's a uh, sperm of an organism that creates another generation of that it's it's a metaphor so when we're, we're saying that we are sons of God it doesn't mean we have been physically uh, you know born out of a, a woman's womb the way Jesus was born out of Mary's womb we were supernaturally conceived and supernaturally born by us accepting believing Jesus into our hearts into our lives okay so therefore the Antichrist can be born again by the seed of Satan now I do believe that will have a physical uh, characteristic but you know what being born again by the Spirit of God has a physical characteristic I remember when, uh, uh, several times actually in my life, somebody who, who knew me from back in Stephenville or knew me from before I was walking with the Lord and then came upon me years later when I was walking with the Lord said, wow, you look different. And it's like, well, am I doing my hair different? Or what exactly is this? Well, it, 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 having Jesus in my life had a physical effect on me okay so I'm not saying that there would be no physical uh, evidence that you have received this seed that is from other into yourself but it didn't happen through a physical process it happened through a spiritual process right okay well so the Antichrist is the son of what? It says perdition. Well, that word tells you everything you need to know because perdition, number 684, simply means destruction, ruin, loss. What does that remind you of? Satan, right? Satan comes to steal, that's loss to kill that's ruin and to destroy okay so what we're seeing here is one of the many ways in which the devil tries to counterfeit or plagiarize what God has done God became a man through Jesus Christ now that that is a that is a deep truth it, it's a mystery but it's one that we believe. It, 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 it's, it's essential to our faith that Jesus is not just an angel. Or Jesus is not just a man who had a better idea. He is God in human flesh. And Mary's womb conceived that word that was spoken. And she physically gave birth to Jesus who is physical and will come back in a physical body. You know in Luke 24 when he appeared to his disciples after his resurrection he said hey touch me you know here here's where here's where they put the nails uh, I'm not a ghost he even ate some food to prove to him that he was in a physical form okay so the devil knows enough of the Bible to know that to fake everybody out he's gonna have to at least seem to be like what God did with Jesus okay and that would involve uh, him being a beast go to Matthew chapter 10 actually no go to Revelation go first you keep go to Matthew you got the place in Matthew but first let's go to Revelation chapter 13 now a beast 
number 2342, is an animal. So that's, that's a physical being. So I'm not trying to spiritualize the Antichrist by saying, well, we don't know who he is. But there, there will be a physical person who will be the Antichrist. And in Revelation 13, it refers to this person as a beast. Now, it's a metaphor, okay? Uh, a beast is a dangerous animal. A, a uh, predator. Revelation 13, he's, uh, John says, I stood on the sandy beast beach and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads and on his horns were ten royal crowns and blasphemous titles on his heads and the beast that I saw resembled a leopard but his feet were like those of a bear and his mouth was like that of a lion and to him the dragon and we know who the dragon is. Revelation 12 says that's Satan. The dragon gave his own might and power and throne and dominion. And then in verse 4, And so the people of the earth fell down and paid homage to the dragon because he had bestowed on the beast all his dominion and authority. And they also praised and worshipped the beast, exclaiming, who is a match for the beast? And who can make war against him? You know, that's just like what we Christians do with Jesus. Mighty warrior, dressed for battle. Holy Lord of all is he. Right? Well, they're going to do that for the Antichrist. Talk about plagiarism. I mean, that's, that's the zenith of plagiarism. And the beast was given the power of speech uttering boastful and blasphemous words, and he was given freedom to exert his authority and exercise his will during 42 months. And he opened his mouth to speak slanders against God, blaspheming his name and his abode. And he was further permitted to wage war on God's holy people, the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him to extend his authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. And all the inhabitants of the earth will fall down in adoration and pay homage to him, everyone whose name has not been recorded in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain. Well... <laughs> This boggles the mind. Why, why would God let himself be assailed in that manner? Well, first of all, God, God is not the one that's going to be harmed by this. God is not harmed by it. Well, then, okay, then why is God letting it happen? Because people have to have a choice which one of these they're going to choose. We, we all have a choice in this matter. The devil doesn't know how you're going to choose. Now, okay, your name has already been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, so I think it's a, it's a foregone conclusion that we will not bow down and worship the Antichrist. I mean, unless we renounced our salvation. And that would be the foolishness of, of foolish. I'm not saying people can't do that, and apparently if the apostasy goes as far as we, it seems to go, that there will be those who do that, because it does speaks in another place in the book of Revelations about their name being blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. But there would be no reason for any of us to do that, and there's no reason for us to fear that, well, you know, maybe I really would worship the Antichrist. Well, no, maybe not. But if you do that or do that, you're probably, well, for sure, if you do that, you're going to end up dead. And if you do that, you're probably going to end up dead too because you're not going to succeed in that. And your only choice is going to be to do that. The 
Back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 10. Verse 16. Jesus said to his disciples, Behold, I'm sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. Well, a wolf would be the epitome of a beast. Right? We are in a world full of predators. And he says, be wary and wise as serpents and be innocent and harmless and guileless and without falsity as doves. Well, that's where this dichotomy here fails. Because if you're going to be, uh, if you're going to take charge, you're not going to be innocent like a dove. And if you're going to be martyred, you're not going to be wise as a serpent. So if you're wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove, you're not going to be either one of those places. You're going to have to be there. Because, see, if you think you're going to take charge, sooner or later you're going to have to play the political game and you're going to have to be better at it than the other side is. Or you're going to have to be willing to go, go uh, kill people. And that's the devil's technique. You're not going to beat the devil at his game. God doesn't want us to play the devil's game. Or if you're uh, harmless as a dove but, but not wise as a serpent, you, you won't even see the devil, what he's doing, until he's done killed you. And in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15... It brings up another thing here that really time is going to, would fail me to go into this in detail. But it says, Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you dressed as sheep, but inside they are devouring wolves. Well, back in Revelation chapter 13, it speaks of a second beast. I'm not going to go into detail about that, but it says the same thing about the second beast, who we will call the false prophet. Verse 11 says, And I saw another beast rising up out of the land, and he had two horns like a lamb. <clears throat> that means he appears to be Christian. But he spoke like a dragon. And he exerts all the power and right of control of the former beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell upon it to deify the first beast whose deadly wound was healed and to worship him. Well, that thing about the deadly wound... That's, that's part of this too, see, because it says in Revelation chapter 17, verse 8, speaking of the Antichrist, it says, The beast that you once saw that was but is no more, he is going to come up out of the abyss the bottomless pit, and go to perdition, and the inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been recorded in the book of life from the foundation of the world will be astonished when they look at the beast because he once was and now is no more and he is to come. Well, see, this working together between the Antichrist and the false prophet is empowered by the power of Satan. And if the false prophet looks like a lamb, 
but speaks like a dragon. What does that tell us? That tells us that he is a representative of Christianity. You know, the lamb, Jesus, or we, the sheep of his pasture. But he's speaking deceptive, beguiling words. This again is part of why God doesn't want us to be deceived because this is the way that Christianity is going. You know, if you think that, well, uh, you're, you're born again and you love Jesus and so anybody out there who says they love Jesus, well, they're one of us or I'm one of them. Don't think that. I'm not saying that you would need to accuse every other Christian of, of being a heretic because they disagree with you on some point. But the point is, this is where the devil is taking things. Okay? Now, there's something else that is being described there in Revelation 17. That, here again, this sounds like science fiction, and science fiction has depicted these things, but I don't know how else I would describe it. Uh, you know, it says that the, the, the power of Satan comes up from the underworld and inhabits the Antichrist. There's a term for that in, in the paranormal world. They call it a walk-in. Where it's kind of the same thing as demon possession. It's when somebody is a willing vessel and they, they just they, they, they empty themselves, which is, by the way, what yoga is designed to do, is to teach people to empty their, empty their mind, make, make, a, make their soul a blank slate so something from out there can come in. Okay, that's what being a walk-in is. And if this is not just a walk, you're not just inviting a demon spirit to come into you. You're inviting the power of Lucifer the, the seething energies of Lucifer, as it refers to, as uh, Manly Hall, I think of the, of the Scottish Rite referred to it as that. Um, that's what the Antichrist is. He is a walk-in in that sense. He's not just a person. Well, how could this be? Well, you think about all the scientific stuff that's going on in our world today. You know, Churchill warned about that, warned that the Nazis were messing with some science that was, was evil and perverted, and they hadn't stopped. Science has not stopped messing with things that are evil and perverted. That's what the, the white horse of Revelation chapter 6 is. It says it's the smallest fabric. What is the smallest fabric of life that we know about? It's DNA. And what is this... Uh, you know, the, the Moderna and the Pfizer uh, vaccines, how do they s say that they're going to attack uh, these, the COVID virus? Through mRNA, through genetic manipulation. So, how does this, how, how does this apply to the Antichrist? Well, really, I'm not sure. I don't know the, the mechanics of it, but it's implied. Okay, secondly, one would have to say that surely the Antichrist and the false prophet are not normal humans. And we know this because in Revelation chapter 19, when Jesus finally comes back with the troops of heaven and puts all of the corruptors of the earth in their place. There's two of them, only two people, two beings that get sent directly to the lake of fire. They don't even go to the great white throne judgment. I mean, it's like he gets them and they go to the lake of fire right away. Revelation chapter 19, verse 19. says, Then I saw the beast... And the rulers and leaders of the earth with their troops mustered to go to battle and make war against him who is mounted on the horse and against his troops. And the beast was seized and overpowered and with him the false prophet who in his presence has worked wonders and performed miracles by which he led astray those 
who accepted and permitted to be placed upon them the stamp or mark of the beast, and those who paid homage and gave divine honor to his statue. Both of them, both the Antichrist and the false prophet, were hurled alive into the fiery lake that burns and blazes with brimstone. Now, everyone else gets to go before the judgment seat of Christ. Why do these guys have a separate dispensation of judgment? The only conclusion I can come to is they're not really like you and me. It's kind of the same question of, well, why did God tell them when, when God took the children of Israel out of Egypt and gave them the Holy Land, why did He say, wipe them all out? Why didn't He give them a chance to, uh, you know, to, to come over to the side of Israel? Well, as best I can tell from, from the, the biblical narrative, those beings, I mean, those cultures had had gone through this process of being genetically modified by spiritual beings because they produced giants. And that wasn't the first time that happened, as you know. Go to Genesis chapter 6. And this is something most Christians don't know. Or they don't think it applies to us today. It says, when men began to multiply, verse 1, when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the, the sons of God, this is angels, saw that the daughters of men were fair and they took wives of all they desired and chose. They procreated with women. And the Lord says, well, my spirit shall not forever dwell and strive with man, for he is flesh, but his days shall yet be 120 years. He gave them some time to change. And there were giants on the earth in those days and afterwards, when sons of God lived with daughters of men and bore children to them, these were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. And it also speaks in Genesis chapter 10. About Nimrod. In Genesis 10, verse 8, it says, Cush became the father of Nimrod. And he was the first to be a mighty man on the earth. Well, this is telling you that what the devil did in Genesis 6 that, that brought all of humanity under the judgment of the flood, he, he carried on again after the flood with some other means. Doesn't really tell you exactly how Nimrod became not fully human, but he did. Because he's the one that had them build the Tower of Babel, remember. And that caused God to, to do something else rather radical for all humanity, which was to scatter us to the four winds of the earth. One went east and one went west and one went over the cuckoo's nest. Right? Well, look, let's bring this to a close. There's a lot there that, that can be explored, and I'm sure that as the days go forward, God will reveal more about how this is playing out in our world. And I recommend you stay tuned for that. I recommend that you don't do what most Christians do and say, oh, well, I'm not going to be here when all of that happens because God's going to rapture me out of here. Or... Well, I can't be deceived because it says the very elect can't be deceived. No, the very elect can be deceived. And even if you are taken out of here, God is going to send you back with instructions that are going to benefit your loved ones and, and your family and the body of Christ. And God has work for us to do. 
for us. The song says you can't slide into heaven on the seat of your pants. You better get up and walk that next mile. But let's talk about that before we close. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. This is how we get up and walk that next mile. <coughs> Second Thessalonians 2, verse 13. But we, brethren, beloved by the Lord. Because God loves us, He's telling us this. We ought and are obligated to give thanks to God for you because God chose you from the beginning to be His first fruits. And that's not just the first fruits converts to Christianity. I mean, okay, maybe that's how Paul meant it. But God chose us to be first fruits through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is not given to us just so we can feel good or so we can have the the fruits of the Holy Spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, and faith. I mean, yeah, that's, that's great in and of itself. But He also gave us the Holy Spirit so we would have access to the gifts of the Spirit, which involves discernment of spirits. It involves words of wisdom, words of knowledge, being in a situation and, and you're, you're totally unprepared and you walk into this thing and something deeply bad, satanic is going on and God is going to tell you this is that and here's what you're supposed to do, here's what you're supposed to say, like if you come home and your front door is unlocked. <laughs> right? Okay, that's a word of wisdom. And it's by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and your belief and adherence to the truth. See, if we don't pay attention to the truth, what the Word says, we can be deceived. And it was to this end that God called you through His gospel. So He didn't just save us so we don't have to go to hell. He saved us because we got work to do. And He's going to empower us to do it. Right? through the gospel, that you may obtain and share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, wow. I mean, I, I wasn't demanding any kind of glorification. And he's not saying, well, it's because you demanded that I'm going to give it to you. No, it's because we receive the truth and we obey the truth. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold fast to the instructions which you were taught whether by our word of mouth or by letter, whether you got it by hearing a preacher tell you about it or you read it for yourself, really, I recommend you have both. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us everlasting consolation, which is what the word from the Lord today was about, everlasting consolation and encouragement and well-founded hope through grace. Comfort and encourage your hearts and strengthen them, make them steadfast, and keep them unswerving in every good work and word. Amen. And so, Father,